and orthopedic surgeons, I think that's going to be absolutely critical to any success. And, and my feeling is that one's going to have to perhaps start small, take small steps, not get stuck into major um, huge spinal deformity surgery initially. That can come later. As Emre said, you know, that's a look, look down the, to the future in five or ten years' time and not get involved with sort of semi-experimental new technologies at this stage because at the end of the day the local surgeons have to get up to speed on that and they're going to be the poor fellows who have to deal with any complications that were to happen. So I think one's going to have to take this step by step. Right, let's get organised here. Right, you've all heard of the big five. I thought it appropriate to rather show you the ugly five when dealing with the topic we've got to hand. So we're talking about a failed back spine surgery and I'm not really going to get stuck on pedantics of definitions and so on. There are many definitions. I think that failed back spine surgery doesn't refer to the case necessarily that has a recurrent disc herniation um, or even possibly where there's adjacent level disease, although it might. It's suggested within that definition that there's a problem that you haven't really addressed or haven't foreseen. That's a scary number up there. 50% of failed back spine surgery patients on review, if you take them as a new patient, take a history again, reassess them, go through all the, all the loops you have to go through, have not met the generally accepted criteria for primary surgical procedure. In other words, possibly they should not have had an operation from the beginning. And this I'll demonstrate later with a case study. Your first surgery is ultimately important. Your chances of success with your first surgery are probably somewhere in the region of 70-80% and that halves every time you operate after that. Our aims when we're treating patients is to give them pain relief, to, if there is neurological deficit, to improve the neurological deficit. So, as I've said, and I don't want to blur the edges here, but you can use this for your assessment of your patient initially. Go back to the beginning. Even if your patient has been operated, as Emre referred to that great hospital called St. Elsewhere, it doesn't matter. Go back to the beginning. Don't just say, oh, goodness, what have they done at Critter Sphere Hospital or wherever it is? Go back and find out the information. Try and piece that whole puzzle together and approach it as if it was your first contact with a patient. Get all the other clinical notes if you can. Approach the doctor who operated on him. It doesn't have to be confrontational. Phone him up and say, Emre, you know, I've got Mrs. Jones here. She's had an operation. She's presented here. This is a problem at the moment. Can you fill me in? And most doctors would be quite happy to fill you in. You don't phone up and say, Jay, what did you get up to here? Because that causes problems between you and your colleague, and it will most definitely cause problems between the first doctor and the patient. And then consult widely. I think the team emphasis has been emphasized uh, already. Go to the physios, go to the general practitioners, find out how they've been managing the patient. Has the patient been compliant? What are the current problems? Is this a new problem? Or is this something related to the surgery? Or has it never changed really? 
So what percentage of the res residual problem is still present? You must also try and between the lines get into pain behavior, substance usage, and psychosocial issues. These can be hugely important in the uh, back pain and radicular pain management. And the latter is not to withhold treatment, it's to manage your patient better. Clinical examination, back to basics, the patient must undress. You have to examine your patient personally. You can't have a medical officer or a, or a houseman or a student in examining the patient and then giving you the story and you don't examine the patient, especially when you're going to make surgical decisions complete assessment of the patient. Make sure that there are no other major comorbidities, the diabetes, the cardiac diseases, etc. And then go back to the original notes and compare your findings. And if needs be, reassess the patient. Are the patient's problems really spinal? I mean, we've seen a number of situations, and I'll show you one or two just now, where you can be so easily caught out. Gynae problems, abdominal problems, vascular problems, The purpose of the investigations is, as I've said, to find out is this a residual residuum of the previous problem? Is it something new? Was there a complication with the surgery that you don't know about, that you haven't heard about, or was something missed? And there's a list of some of the problems that might result from previous surgery. You want an anatomical diagnosis, and I think one's got to look at these problems as a game, as a chess game. Then it becomes fun. You want to get to the answer in the shortest number of moves. And then it becomes a bit of a challenge and becomes very interesting. It's often difficult with your first surgery, but trust me, it's a lot more complex once you've got a surgical scar, you've got adhesions, you've got all sorts of other complications. But if you look at the time of presentation, you can sometimes get an idea. Say the patient in the recovery room, the recovery sister calls you and says, well, Mr. Whoever, has still come, he's shouting and complaining of pain in his leg. You've got an issue. Somewhere something's gone wrong. You've left a fragment of disc behind the root. There's an osteophyte still compressing. Or, and you would know about it, seeing as you operated, there's been a complication. You've damaged a nerve root or done something. If he's okay for a couple of days and then, then starts getting uh, more pain and back pain, obviously you're going to think about infection. And in the medium term, problems like re-herniation, fibrosis, etc. And then the longer term you're looking at your adjacent level disease. But those are very generalized statements, but they can be used as a guide. And you've always got to keep on your toes. Just to look at this lady. She's 66 years old. She's known with myasthenia gravis, chronic cortisone usage. She's known with osteoporotic uh, spinal fractures. She's had surgery for that and she's now referred in as paraparetic. She can't stand, she's got terrible low back pain, extending down into her buttocks. While she's lying in bed, she's a lot better, and in fact, neurologically intact. No myelopathy, no cordae equina signs. So we do an x-ray, and uh, that's the surgery she had at St. Elsewhere. You can see the level above, there's a, there's a fracture, compression fracture. So we did a scan and um, she's got pretty tight stenosis up there, so problem solved. You can see it better there. So what's the treatment? What, what are we going to do? Do we manage her conservatively? Someone earlier today said bed rest is old fashioned. We can decompress that level at T11-12. You can decompress and fuse it, or we can take it a level above. We can wait and see or do something else. Any, any problems here? Let's have a show of hands for one. Two. We've got a couple there. Three. Four. Are we all one and four at the back? Okay, the problem here bothered me. She was absolutely neurologically intact, no signs of cordae equina. 
the, the pain was an issue, low back buttock pain. So we did an isotope scan. And she had in bilateral insufficiency fractures of the halo of the sacrum. And we've seen a couple of these, and they can catch you out time after time if you don't go and look for them. Neurologically find terrible pain if they stand up. They can't stand. They just quite cannot stand. It looks as though they've got weak legs. Test their legs, it's fine. I'm not saying <clears throat> sorry, I'm not saying she doesn't have a stenosis at T eleven twelve, but that wouldn't have done anything for her pain. So it's got to be at a really tight fit, what they're complaining of, what you're picking up on your investigation, and what you're seeing on your special investigations. We are 2013, we think we're very sharp, got fantastic technology. The Beast in 1940 described the lateral recess in the spinal canal. And it's still the most common cause of so-called failed back surgery syndrome. Because what happens is you have a patient with a nice central stenosis, you get in there and it's tight and it's difficult and you clear it out and the dura bulges out and it all looks done, job done. But you don't get down into that recess, depress the dura, get down so that you can see the exit of the nerve root and clear that nerve root. Because all you've done is you've cleared the central section and the nerve root is still being severely compressed. There's an osteophyte compressing the root, and the area we're talking about is there, just where the nerve root leaves the dura before it gets under the pedicle. That's the lateral recess. It can be compressed by an osteophyte, it can be compressed by ligament and flavum, can be compressed by a degenerative synovial cyst from the facet joint. If you don't clear that, job's not done. And that patient will haunt you and come back over. And the surgery next time around with a lot of fibrosis in that area is a lot more difficult. Okay, so investigation wise, what do we do? We've heard from the radiologist, and happily I agree fully with him that x rays are still very, very useful. I think that people are becoming more and more aware of the dangers of x-ray and repeated x-rays. I think repeating APs and laterals of the spine every time the patient sees you in OPD is out. But I think as a baseline, you need those basic views that I've listed up there. And they can help you make the diagnosis even when it's missed on a, on a fancy MR scan. And I'll show you something about that shortly. Basic bloods, full blood count, COP and alkaline phosphatase. And as I said, examine the patient, hands on the patient. And one of the best signs of an infection in the patient, if you don't yet see anything on the skin, it's not red, it's not inflamed, just tap him down the, down the spine. You and I, we can have a disc and it's still not that sore. You tap someone with a discitis or an infection, he jumps. He is really painful to that sort of sudden bang on his back. So, let's look at this guy. This chap comes in with back pain, really bad, and that's his MR scan, and then he offers on a, on a diagnosis. He's got a bit of a disc sitting there on the axial, and maybe a little bit of a disc on the, on the, on the uh, sagittal view there, but his problem's back pain. Okay, so he did an x-ray. Any help now? Okay, so he's had a hip replacement. What's the cause of this gentleman's pain? He's got back pain. It's a massive aortic aneurysm with erosion into the vertebral body. You can make that diagnosis on a plain, simple, good old x-ray. Let's go back to the scan. There it is. Bottom line, when you're looking at these pictures, we always, we all do it, look and you focus on the main pathology. You get back pain is a disc, so you're going to look at the spinal column. You don't, you've got to make a point. Look at the top of the picture, look at the bottom of the picture, look at the left hand side, look at the right hand side, and you'll be amazed at the number of times the actual pathology is sitting just right at the top or right at the bottom or at one of the sides. Okay, so MR, um, MR is the 
tool of choice, as we've heard from Dr. Rowe. Um, and it's pretty standard. You want your T1s, T2s, you want your axials, you want your sagittals. And uh, I've managed to intimidate our radiologists to give me a couple of extra cuts. They give me a coronal cut through the spine, and I get a coronal cut through the hips on every spine. And the amount of pathology you find that keeps you on the straight and narrow is amazing. CT myelogram is an art that is being lost at the moment. People do it very seldomly because of MR, but there's still a very definite place for it. And it's something that might, in fact, one can upskill the, the staff at, at the hospitals here for spinal surgery. It's a good backstop, especially if you're going to be doing spinal surgery. You don't have an MR at the hospital. You have a post-operative issue. You can quite often get fairly far down the road with a CT myelogram. So it's not too old-fashioned yet. And we've spoken about bone scans. Just briefly, what you can see on a coronal of the spine, and it depends where you, where you cut it, you can pick up the nice nerve root within the foramen, and you can see it traversing. I don't have a path pathological specimen here. But you can see the nerve root surrounded by, by fat, and it often helps enormously to pick up a intraforaminal sequestration, which might in fact be very, very small. You may, may miss it on the axial cuts. Here's someone else, severe pain. And once again, back to basics. If you're examining your back, it means you're examining the hips and the knees as well. If you don't do that, you're going to miss it. This guy comes in, I said to him, you've got a hip problem. He said, I have not got a hip problem. Pulls out his x-rays. And you look at his x-rays, his hip joints look fairly reasonable. But if you look at it carefully, there's a slight uneven edge on that hip. You look at his coronal cut, both hips are gone. He might not need surgery, he might well respond to Jeff's tissue treatment in terms of easing his pain. But this guy is going to end up with bilateral hip replacements. Point being that precise correlation of history, clinical findings and investigation is even more necessary now than it was before. It's not a question, people often say it's easy now. You just send the guy for a MR scan, get the report, you got your answer. By the time we deal, when we're dealing with degenerative diseases, we all have osteophytes, we all have narrowed discs, we all have this or that. Does that correlate with what the patient's problem is? The MR is there just to confirm your clinical diagnosis. So by the time you've chatted to him, you've examined him, you've got to have a pretty good idea of where you're going. I think I'll just move on there, that's fairly obvious. So in terms of other investigations, electrophysiology depends on the operator. Sometimes it can be hugely valuable, sometimes it's of no value. And it's very, very operator dependent. Um, and can help you differentiate a, a nerve root problem from a more peripheral uh, or cordae equina root problem. I know I'm repeating myself, examine the x-rays yourself, don't work off the report, never. You've got to be mindful of your costs in terms of in requesting exam special investigations and I would imagine that's as important here in Botswana as it is back home. You have to have that tight fit that I've spoken about. What the patient complains of, what you find on, in, on examination, and what you find on your special investigations. Other testing modalities, discography, I don't personally think there's credible evidence to support that. There are people that do use it. Nerve root blocks, I would say no credible evidence. Facet blocks, yes, if you know that that's the facet joint that's causing the problem, and you can inject that specific joint. Injecting in your rooms on the table? No, you've got to use screening to do that. So you know exactly where you're putting that stuff. Psychological testing, again, there's no real credible evidence to subject everyone to psychological testing. But if you are concerned that there is an element there, then get expert opinion on your patient. Okay, so quick case. This guy is 22 years old. He was 22 years old. He had a football injury and uh, he had low back pain. Um, when he got to 25, he wanted to go to the army, and they said, no, he's got back problems, he can't go in. So anyway, uh, they was assessed and they um, said it was a non-surgical problem, 
And at 28, he went through a whole lot of tests, and then they said, no, he's good to go. He can go to the Navy. And uh, he joined the Navy, and in his first couple of months, he was on a boat, rammed another boat in a military action, and his back pain became worse. Um, he then consulted around and remained neurologically intact the entire time. He had some vague findings on an air spinogram, so obviously you know this was a couple of years back. And the surgeon said, I can fix you. So he did a double level procedure on him, the decompression. Very slow progress after that. A year later he went to another surgeon and um, he said, you know, I really didn't, don't think you needed surgery at that stage. They didn't really investigate you properly. And he did some more investigations and it was normal, no degenerative disease, no instabilities. And he said, I'm not operating on you. So he then went along and uh, became a bit older and his disc space collapsed. He in, in the interim developed Addison's, he was on long-term corticosteroids. He went to another surgeon and they said, ah, we can fix you. Fused him, L5-S1, SI joint fusion on the left, plates, wires. They didn't have artificial discs, they put in a fenced on ball there. And he had a bit of a rough time after that. Deep wound infection, repeated packing, debridements. So by now, he's on to operation number four. He gradually improves and three years later, he develops another abscess, Staph aureus, a good old friend, and he has his fifth operation. Four years later, he's kind of hooked on amphetamines, steroid injections, various alternate therapies. Sometimes he's using crutches to walk. He goes to a new physician, by now the penny drops and they say, okay, no more surgery. So they get him strengthening up, flexibility exercises, a bit of bracing, and He's a well-motivated guy and they get him going on with life. Who's this guy? Hmm? So one can say, well, how in heaven's name did this guy manage to carry on with his work? He's just that kind of guy. You know, he was highly motivated pushed by his family um, and he could carry on functioning with the optimal at that time medical support. But the, if you go back to it, it started off on the wrong step. He had an operation that probably wasn't needed. He was neurologically intact, he had a vague investigation and then had a double level procedure. Plus he had comorbidities, serious nature of comorbidities didn't have the correct investigations. His expectation was he'd have the operation, walk out and go back to work. I, I, we all know he had a fairly hectic social life as well. <laughs> and then you throw in the complications of surgery. So that's the critical point is the first operation, make jolly sure that the very time you go and operate on someone, you, you know what you're going, you know what your goal is, you know what you can achieve. You have to know what you can achieve, not what someone else can achieve. We've spoken a little bit about total disc replacements today. I'm not going to shoot them down, but I'm not going to do them because I don't do 100 or 150 a year. And I want to be able, if you're doing an operation, you must be able to do that comfortably, do a lot of them, and be absolutely comfortable with dealing with all the complications. So that's kind of an operation that's not going to happen here in a hurry because if uh, Christian comes and does one, he jumps on a plane in two or three days time and then these poor fellows are left to deal with the complications and complications for anterior disc surgery with a disc replacement can get pretty hairy and going back on that is, is not a happy procedure. So you've got to choose your procedures according to your circumstances and your capabilities. But when the patient comes back with pain, don't say, oh no, that's normal. Six months later, yeah, no, sure, you're gonna have terrible pain down your leg six months after the operation. Well, that's nonsense. You've got to go and investigate them early and find out what the problem is so they retain some confidence in, in their surgery. Otherwise, they wander around and you then can't advise them. They'll go and see the guy down the road or the guy in the next town. 
and that's where the whole roller coaster starts in terms of inappropriate surgery, alternative interventions are possibly inappropriate, and this obviously has huge financial implications. So, recognize your limitations, recognize the limitations and the benefits of what you can achieve, and make sure that your initial procedure is well thought out and planned. If there's no neural compressive problem, no mechanical instability, beware that you're not going to contribute to the failed back surgery syndrome. Thank you very much.